Okay, and welcome back to the personality chapter. The personality chapter carries on our discussion of constructs and the use of factor analysis in evaluating psychological properties. These are topics that we started evaluating in the intelligence chapter and they carry over in their same manner here to the personality chapter. Now to really get started with the personality chapter we really have to look at some of the basics of the history for personality because one of the topics that I've mentioned in the intelligence chapter which is also true here is that the last four topics that we cover this semester intelligence, personality, psychological disorders, and social psychology all start from a separate process of theorizing that was different than what we saw in the first eight chapters of the semester that led to the underlying processes that affect all patterns of behavior. These broader aspects like personality have a separate historical approach to them, separate theorizing, they come from different areas, and in fact many of the early developments theoretically from these areas still color the fields today. So to get started with the historical aspect, we're going to look actually at a movie instead of having me lecture. And when this movie is over, we'll get back and start discussing how this history has influenced the development of personality theory today. Now, remember Helmholtz? His own professor is Johann Muller, this guy, who is deeply into life with a capital L and what makes everything tick. And he's spending time here in the Belgian drizzle because he's overworked like crazy and is hiding out in Ostend with a pre-suicide depression. Fun guy. Meanwhile, what does Muller mean by that stuff about what makes everything tick? Well, what Muller is thinking of is one of those weird may the force be with you things operating in people, in animals, even in plants. To start with, take a look at the bit of a plant that fascinates Muller, the buds. And remember, this is before Darwin and evolution and all that. OK, says Muller, how do the new plants come into existence? Like, are they in here already? And when they do, how do they get to end up the way they are? Like this, all neat and organized and doing whatever each bit of the plant is supposed to do. And is that all already organized in here? And if that's the case, are all the bits of all the future descendants of this little plant in here? Nah. Muller says, what does all the organizing and running of everything is another one of those mystery phenomena you can't see or examine. The life force. And not just in plants, in animals, like the force going down one of your nerves. And this force can never be measured. Well, Helmholtz reacts to this mumbo-jumbo, and in 1852 he runs some experiments on a frog muscle. Don't worry, this frog is safe. Helmholtz zaps the frog muscle with electricity. The muscle twitches and makes a mark on recording paper. So, you knew to the 11 millionth of a second when you did the zapping, and now you know how long it takes for the electricity to go down the frog muscle nerve and make it twitch. At about 90 feet a second. So you can measure the mystery life force. Which is why I'm back on the beach at Ostend. Because Muller's life force idea is known as vitalism. And after what Helmholtz does to it, you'd think that would be the death of the life force idea, right? Except for another German who spends many experimental years on the beach, in his case Monte Carlo, and takes over as leader of the vitalist movement. His name is Ludwig Klages. And you know Klage is better than you may think for something else he gets up to. 
because Clarges is the guy who analyzes the way people move and comes up with what we now call body language and the language of gesture. Stuff like this. Clarges says body language gives your secret feelings away. I mean, take this couple. See how she's crossed her legs away from him and folded her arms defensively? She doesn't like him. But look at him, leaning towards her, nodding when she nods, legs crossed towards her. This, says Clarges, is a couple of people trying not to display their inner feelings, but sending out messages in spite of themselves. Clarges reckons every move you make gives you away like that, shows the real you, behind what he calls the mask of courtesy. Clarges uses his research to develop a new science he calls characterology and sells it as a hotshot analytical tool when you're interviewing people for job selection. Now, remember what the date is, hmm? By this time, just after the First World War, and Klages is a German. And he's into irrational life force stuff and behavioral studies and all that, what's behind the mask stuff. And it's just before you know what happens in Germany. So you just know what kind of job selection his characterology is going to get used for. This is the job Klage's characterology gets used for when the Nazis are trying to find the type of person who will make an ideal officer in the SS. Men of iron self-control, superior, all that stuff. Something else Klage's dreams up gets grabbed by the Nazi selectors too. Handwriting analysis. Klages is the guy who starts all that stuff about handwriting being another way to see into a person's character. The idea being, the way you write is a mixture of all the conflicting forces that make up your personality. And graphology, as it's called, can reveal which side of your personality has got the upper hand. So Klages' graphology says, for example, large sloping letters show either enthusiasm and getting on with people, or, depending which side of you is stronger, lack of realism and a tendency to rashness. On the other hand, small vertical writing is either realism and rationality or lack of enthusiasm and a certain coldness of character. So, how do you know which? Well, according to Klages, you can see that from how rhythmic the writing is. Which, what do you know, is another one of those things that can't be measured in any scientific way. It can only be understood intuitively. Don't think I'd have made it through to the SS. My handwriting is clearly realistic and rational with a touch of paranoia. And, you will note, barely readable. Now, one of the reasons why Klage's graphology claims to be able to reveal character from writing is because everybody's is unique. That movie tells us a lot about the early developments in, uh, in the field of personality itself. And there are some things that we need to kind of cover again uh, that were very relevant because some of these things actually cross over with the history that we talked about back in Chapter 1. Uh, for example... Uh, the role of Helmholtz uh, determining the speed with which action potentials travel through the nervous system was a topic uh, that really was evaluated back around the 1850s. And it was during this time, and in, in, in part, uh, that work got done because of the, uh, the ideas of vitalism, uh, the idea that uh, there was a life force inside of a person and uh, it could not actually be measured. Uh, these were ideas from Mueller and uh, Mueller led that whole story of vitalism uh, 
And it probably even sounds somewhat familiar today uh, still, the idea that there's kind of a life force inside of a, a person, especially even if you're not going to apply it uh, to plants any longer. Um, and it's a way that a lot of people still think. Uh, but the idea really doesn't hold up under scientific scrutiny because uh, there is no form of energy or some other such thing that can be evaluated or identified by physicists uh, and without any actual physical properties to evaluate you cannot conclude that there is a life force inside of an individual some of the other uh, stories in this uh, film that we took a look at um, are related to Klages. Uh, Klages developed two ideas neither which are of any value today. Uh, the first was the development of body language. Um, and body language is a, a topic that still floats around in the general media as though it's uh, something uh, that you should be paying attention to. And in fact, uh, I've even seen on television on the 24-hour uh, news cycles where people bring in supposed experts on body language to evaluate uh, the personality of the president while the president gives a speech and uh, that is just a load of nonsense and uh, it's done for entertainment purposes if the people in the media actually believe they're doing something of value uh, it's only because they uh, have not actually checked any of their facts the idea that body language expresses internal personality characteristics uh, simply comes from the idea that your body language will be in some way related to the pattern of behavior that you're exhibiting at any one time. And I'm not arguing that being the case because that very much seems to be true. The pattern of behavior you exhibit at any one time is related to the thoughts that you're probably having at that moment. But it is not a measure of long-term personality characteristics and because as we're going to wind up seeing in this chapter personality is defined largely by its stability as a pattern of behavior that will last over the course of years if not decades and very possibly over the course of your entire life the field of personality focuses on long-standing patterns of behavior Anything that changes rapidly is not evaluated by personality psychologists. Characteristics that are long-standing are the things that they selectively identify. And so when Clogg has worked in the topic of body language, he was trying to understand personality characteristics, that is long-standing patterns of behavior, from the standpoint of some select pattern of behavior that was occurring at any one time. And there is no good evidence uh, that, those, uh, that there is a good connection between uh, your body language today and long-standing personality patterns. Um, it's, uh, it's an idea that still floats around the media, is presented uh, as fact oftentimes, in that sense, but uh, does not have any scientific basis for it. The second bad idea that Klages came up with uh, was handwriting analysis, uh, also known as graphology. Uh, the idea that you can determine somebody's personality characteristics from evaluating the actual way in which they write in cursive um, would uh, would be uh, basically what uh, Klages was trying to get at. Uh, but again, uh, graphology is a failed area of inquiry. Uh, you cannot determine a person's long-standing personality characteristics for, from evaluating the manner in which they write. Uh, one of the ways in which graphology actually is applied, which will cause confusion um, in general when you talk about handwriting analysis are times in which historical papers are evaluated to see who actually wrote it. So for example, suppose in the basement of the Vatican somebody uncovers a letter that 
appears to be written by Leonardo da Vinci, but it's not signed by anyone. A handwriting analysis very well may take place, evaluating the manner in which the letters were used, the, uh, or the letters were created, the uh, vocabulary that was used, the sentence structure, um, and the way T's were crossed, the way I's were dotted, and so forth, to try to relate this unsigned letter to a signed letter by da Vinci to see whether or not it was possibly da Vinci who wrote the unsigned letter. That's as close as you can get to graphology today that has any actual value. The idea that even if you had a letter by Leonardo da Vinci that was signed and everybody agreed was written by da Vinci, that you could evaluate the actual cursive, the, the angles of the letter, the sloping of the S's and the L's and how the, their sizes and how fluid the handwriting was and relate that back to a permanent personality characteristic for the person is just nonsense. Uh, that, that was a theoretical idea generated by Clages, played out through many people, mostly in the t early 20th century, but the idea has since vanished. Nobody seriously takes the idea that you can evaluate handwriting to determine a personality characteristic. Um, and it's, it's a bad idea, but it's part of the development of personality. And when you pull all these things together, Mueller's idea of vitalism, Clogg's ideas of body language and handwriting analysis, they were part of the development of personality in the late 1800s, early 20th century. And they still have some influence on how the field of personality looks today. Um, as we will go through different theories of personality in this chapter, you'll actually see some of these old concepts kind of floating around in the back, not necessarily addressed directly, but the flavor of these broad conceptual ideas influencing personality characteristics still is there to some degree. Now there are areas of personality work that get done today that are really operating from a much more scientific standpoint and you won't wind up seeing these kinds of broad vitalism approach. Uh, and those are the ones, those are the theories that we're going to wind up focusing on. So if we uh, look specifically at this particular slide, personality is a construct. A very important point for you to get Remember again, as I'll say over and over again in these last four chapters, intelligence, personality, psychological disorders, and social psychology are all constructs. They all involve large amounts of constructs, unlike the uh, things we saw in the first eight chapters. And constructs are an umbrella term that encompasses a wide range of theoretically related behaviors. So when you talk about IQ, for example, from the previous chapter, IQ was really determined by a test where you were being measured in terms of quantitative reasoning as well as verbal reasoning as well as analytical or problem solving. So that was math skills, language skills, and problem solving skills. And when you pull all of that together, and give it one numerical value that was supposed to represent your intelligence quotient. The same sort of idea holds true here in personality. There are many different patterns of behavior that you can exhibit and when you pull them all together and stick them under one umbrella term you'll refer to it as a particular personality characteristic. And as you might imagine there's going to be a wide range of ways in which people can display different types of personality characteristics which will make personality more difficult to analyze because a very well-defined personality characteristic uh, 
is not necessarily something everybody's going to be working with. Uh, what actually constitutes a particular personality characteristic is still somewhat debatable and it still gets uh, determined based upon the theoretical approach of the researcher and as a result you wind up with different researchers defining personality in slightly different ways therefore there are slightly different measures of personality therefore the end result is going to be a poor ability for personality uh, to be measured in a very accurate way or for personality characteristics to apply universally to all people. It's one of the underlying problems in the field of personality and it largely comes from this broader thinking that kind of took place back in the 1800s that's still with us today. So is it possible to characterize an entire person's behavioral makeup with a few simple measures? The answer is going to be absolutely not. Uh, that's not something you can do. In fact, we couldn't even do that with the first construct that we're working with in the last chapter, the intelligence chapter. In the intelligence chapter, if you and your friend both took an IQ test and you both scored 100, would that mean that your IQs were exactly the same? Now the value of 100 would indicate it was the same, but the value of 100 is actually a combination of the different sub or subscales that are on the test. So for example, you may have scored high in math and low in uh, language. Your friend may have scored high in language and low in math. But when you pull together the scores on any one of those exams, you wind up with an overall IQ value of 100. So to say that you have two people, each with an IQ of 100, does not say that they have the exact same IQ, other than the overall value of it. Because intelligence is a construct, and a construct is being made from multiple systems, you have to combine the systems together to give it one overarching numerical value or as you'll wind up seeing in the personality chapter a name not so much a numerical value for a personality characteristic but a type of name like a narcissistic personality a paranoid personality a schizoid personality those are the ways in which per personality characteristics are analyzed and named but you don't wind up with a personality of 15. There's not a 207 value of personality. Personality is always measured by names, not numbers. And that reflects the fact that there are multiple characteristics of personality that are being pulled together. And those, uh, the way in which they're pulled together is not always universal across researchers. So again, today, when you evaluate personality characteristics, you don't always have every single theoretician or laboratory working from the exact same standpoint. And as a result, you wind up with an underlying slop in the data that causes confusion regarding what's actually going on. So that leads us to a very basic question here, which should be easy to understand at this current time. Which of the following tests gives a single numerical value that expresses your personality? And the answer is none of the above. All right. In fact, uh, as you read the chapter, you will see that all of these uh, tests are different types of personality inventories that have existed or still exist today. Uh, but they, uh, they do not give a single numerical value that expresses your personality. In fact, uh, personality is a broader construct than intelligence. So if you took the construct of intelligence, it would be a subset of the broader aspect of all things that influence personality. And as a result, intelligence, which is too difficult to give a single numerical value to, to fully express it, is only a subset of all the things that make up personality. As a result, the 
names you give to personality characteristics frequently lead to a great deal of confusion and as a result you wind up with difficulty trying to pin down exactly what uh, personality construct is being applied for any one researcher. Now the field of personality has gone through many different theoretical approaches and in fact the, uh, the, the theories of personality are myriad. Uh, we're going to focus on four of them. Uh, the first two that we focus on are theoretical approaches that you're probably very familiar with. And you may have never taken a psychology class before, but almost everything I tell you about the first two theoretical approaches, the psychodynamic approach by Sigmund Freud and the phenomenological approach, which is a name you've probably never heard of, um, by Abraham Maslow, who is also an individual you probably never heard of, led to the hierarchy of needs. And the hierarchy of needs is probably something you are somewhat familiar with. Because both Sigmund Freud's psychodynamic approach and Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs are personality constructs that have been used and reused over and over again for decades in the popular media as kind of uh, the popular way in which psychology is presented. Unfortunately, both of these theoretical approaches have almost no value today in the field of scientific psychology. We're going to cover these areas because it's important for me to express to you where these theories came from and how they operate so that you understand why these topics are so incorrect. Because even after the semester ends, you're going to go off into a world that constantly presents Sigmund Freud and hierarchy of needs and one of the most, uh, one of the most popular aspects of the hierarchy of needs, the concept of self-esteem which plays out on talk shows all the time, is always identified as something very, very important to a modern psychologist, but that is nothing more than an entertainment fantasy, an old psychological theory that has no value today, but is still used and over and over again in the popular media to talk about psychology. And that's why we have to actually spend time talking about two theoretical approaches that actually have no value uh, for us today because it is simply the way in which information about psychology is presented in the general media. And if you are a psychology student, it is very likely you're going to be faced with questions about these things by people that you meet. Uh, when you look for information uh, through the internet, for example, uh, you're going to wind up finding uh, concepts of Freud and Maslow oftentimes repackaged in more modern forms so that their names of the things that you're talking about have changed. But they're the same old concepts and they are simply being reused because they have a lot of entertainment value. And you'll see the entertainment value as we start to talk about them. The last two approaches the social learning approach and the trade approach deal with two basic concepts that are at the heart of modern scientific psychology today. The social learning approach is related to nurture. That is the role of the environment in influencing your personality development. The trade approach, which is largely based on genetics or any underlying biological principles that influence personality development, is part of nature. So for this entire semester we've always had this background concept of nature and nurture working together. Remember that was the main target point from chapter 3. Nature and nurture are not topics that are in contrast with each other. They are two of the broadest theoretical aspects of scientific psychology today and they always interplay with each other. The environment is necessary to feed into your 
biology and then your biology processes things and then influences the environment. And there's a constant give and take between the environment and biology. And so at the current time, you wind up seeing the, uh, the roles of environment and biology in terms of personality development being identified as separate areas or separate fields. And it's not because they contrast with each other. It's just that the areas are so large now that you have to specialize in either environmental control of personality or the genetic or underlying biological components of personality today. So if we were to look at this question, which two personality theories are based on outdated modes of thought? The answer is A, psychodynamic and phenomenological. Psychodynamic, remember from the previous slide, is related to Sigmund Freud, and the phenomenological is related to Abraham Maslow, who created the hierarchy of needs. Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor in Vienna, Austria, during the late 1880s, early 1890s. Freud had no interest in psychology, but as a medical doctor, he was trained in neurology. Now, neurology is, of course, uh, the field of study in which you're evaluating how the nervous system influences uh, your ability to behave and think and, uh, of course, uh, engage in other kinds of medically related responses like control over your gastrointestinal system and your liver and kidneys and so forth. But keep in mind, let's say in the 1890s, how much was actually known about the brain and the nervous system? Not a whole lot, right? We saw back in the history in chapter one, there's very little brain mapping studies being done back in the 1800s. Um, and only in a very general sense, do you get an idea of which areas of the brain are controlling which patterns of behavior. You have an idea of the speed of action potentials that are traveling through the nervous system, but there's not a whole lot you can do with that information other than use it in studies for reaction time to make a theoretical map of uh, the pathways that exist in the brain and how people think through particular pathways. Other than that, even the concept of a synapse is not developed as a theoretical idea until 1901 in Portugal. And so uh, back in the 1890s, the, the concepts that are actually necessary to understand how your brain and nervous system operate simply are not there. And this is the point at which Sigmund Freud, a medical doctor in Vienna, Austria, is starting to do his psychological work. Because he operates a neurological clinic, uh, Freud evaluates anybody that has brain damage or peripheral nervous system damage. So they may get their arm crushed in a, a some sort of factory press, you know, like an industrial accident. They may get run over by a, a wagon. Uh, you, uh, you will have people with uh, brain damage from strokes or, or head injuries. A neurologist back at that time really could not do a whole lot other than to send the person home with a series of suggestions about what to do. You know that even today, in 2020, if a person has central nervous system tissue damage, there's not a whole lot a medical doctor can do uh, to, to treat it currently. Uh, neurological problems in the peripheral nervous system will tend to clear themselves up slowly over time, provided there's not too much damage. And a lot of that is actually very similar to the way things get treated today. Um, so in terms of uh, the 1890s, there's really very little a neurologist could actually do to treat a neurological disorder. And so while Freud's seeing these patients, giving them suggestions about how to treat themselves um, and send them home, he begins uh, seeing some patients 
that have very odd types of neurological problems that don't make sense with respect to the anatomy of the nervous system. For example, hysterical blindness. In some cases, an individual who has no particular event of being exposed to a poison or an explosion, having a genetic history in their family of going blind, they simply will be sighted one day, they go to sleep, they wake up the next day and they're blind. But nothing seems to have actually happened to cause the person to go blind. Same thing also happens in terms of loss of limb control. A person will be able to use their arms and their legs, their hands perfectly fine, and then one day they'll wake up and they won't be able to use their arm. It'll simply fall limp on the side of their body as though they had had a stroke and the stroke had only affected their arm. Or the same kind of process might happen to their leg or only a portion of their leg. Like it might affect their thigh but not their calf. It might affect their calf but not their thigh. And aspects like this don't seem to make sense with respect to uh, neurological problems. Um, one of the really odd ones uh, that really would stand out that does not affect or does not relate to the anatomy of the nervous system is that sometimes an individual would have a ring of numbness on their arm or leg. A ring. So if you had placed like a rubber band on your arm, for example, and try to imagine that the ring around where the rubber band exists simply goes numb and you can't feel it any longer. Um, that does not make sense from a neurological standpoint because if you remember how the nerves through your arm or your leg uh, splay out from one main branch that runs through your arm and how there are smaller branches that fan out like the, uh, like the roots of a plant. There's no one spot in the, that structure where you can damage it that would cause a ring of numbness. If there was one central location that was damaged, it would cause a very broad, uh, a, bro a very broad area of numbness to occur as a result but not a very select specific ring. This led Freud to begin to assume that if the, if the anatomy of the nervous system was not related to these problems, that maybe the problems were related to a psychological disorder. And so he began uh, evaluating these ideas. Now, how can he evaluate them? He, well, he can only theorize about them because in the 1890s, there's simply very little information about the anatomy of the nervous system with respect to the specific cells and how they're connected to each other. And there's almost no information whatsoever in the field of psychology that's going to relate nervous system activity to patterns of behavior. So Freud is completely on his own and he has to theorize about how these things operate. So he begins guessing, which is of course the best you could possibly do. His guesses are done by, uh, his guesses are theoretical in nature. He tries to couch them in terms of what he actually knows. And so some of the, some of the things that he takes from uh, the available theories of the time are things like hypnosis. Hypnosis we talked about back in the states of consciousness chapter and in the memory chapter and what we found was by the time that scientific studies on hypnosis were conducted in the 1970s hypnosis does not allow a person to remember old memories better because you're in a hypnotic state and in fact sitting quietly and thinking is equivalent to being hypnotized in terms of your ability to remember old memories. But Freud doesn't know this because it's nearly 80 years before any of those studies actually gets done. Freud does not develop hypnosis. As we saw in previous chapters, hypnosis was developed by James Braid in 1843. 
The concept has floated through uh, the medical community over time. Um, it is only peripherally connected to psychology at this point in time in history. And uh, Freud simply takes it as a possible way to try to understand why his patients have these odd uh, neurological problems. It's actually suggested to him uh, by other psychiatrists of the time that Freud might be able to hypnotize a person and then have the person regress back to an earlier time in their life to relive events at, an, at a younger age. And this would be called age regression, hypnotic age regression. And this is where the idea came from. Now, I can tell you today, hypnotic age regression does not age regress a person in any realistic sense. If a person plays out that they are acting like a four-year-old because you have hypnotized them and told them that they're a four-year-old, they're simply acting the way they believe a four-year-old might actually act, but they do not develop the characteristics of a four-year-old uh, being in the um, pre-operational stage of development. They don't have the other characteristics of cognitive skills of a four-year-old, for example. They simply act like an adult who's pretending to be a four-year-old. And in that sense, it's clear that they are not truly being age regressed. One of the other topics that Freud focuses on is actually something he, he comes up with himself, which is free association. Freud theorizes that a person's thoughts in their head exist in different states, that there's conscious thinking and thinking that occurs that you're not aware of, that he calls subconscious thinking. And that Freud theorizes, again, purely theorizing, he doesn't have proof of this, he's just theorizing that it exists, that some of the thinking that exists in this theoretical subconscious is thoughts that will wind up affecting your behavior that you're not consciously aware of. Now that should sound like a very common uh, idea today. Um, and, uh, and there are variations of that that exist today, uh, but we're going to stick with Freud's topic originally. So he creates, theoretically, the idea of a subconscious in your brain. That is specifically Freud's idea. And it is developed largely because he's working with people that have neurological problems that don't make sense with respect to the known anatomy of the time. And so Freud's theorizing that they have a psychological disorder which is playing itself out in terms of neurological symptoms. So Freud has come up with the idea of hypnosis and free association as a way to, uh, to, to get at these problems. Now, this slide here is a list of bad ideas that Freud has given us. These are all blind alleys that have been evaluated scientifically up until about the 1950s consistently with very poor evidence to support them, so much so that for the individuals in the field of psychology that that insist on pushing a scientific approach and not a philosophical approach, uh, the scientific psychologists simply have had to drop these topics because there is not support for them. So, for example, in Freud's approach, psychotherapy occurred on a couch. Well, why? Well, Freud theorized, again, purely theorizing, that if a person physically relax themselves by laying on a couch, that they would then relax their mental defenses. So this idea that you had conscious thinking and subconscious thinking, and the thing that kept uh, the, the process that kept subconscious thinking from ever being aware in conscious thinking were something called defense mechanisms. 
Again, another theoretical concept, something that will probably sound very familiar to you today, but they are not a scientifically verified concept. They are simply things that uh, Freud created uh, that there is no actual justification for today. So the reason why Freud got the idea that psychotherapy should occur on a couch is because he theorized that if a person physically relaxes themselves by laying down, the physical relaxation would then cause a relaxation to these defense mechanisms. And therefore, thinking from the subconscious would start to leak out and come out in the person's conscious thinking. But subconscious thinking was theorized to exist by Freud to exist in kind of a coded manner so that ideas in the subconscious were in a form that had to be deciphered by a therapist because they would not just be literal thoughts, they would be coded messages. And the coded messages could only be understood by a therapist that trained themselves to uncode these messages. Today, psychotherapy does not occur on a couch. Psychotherapy could occur with you standing on your head, if that was the best way. As the, the main goal today is for you to participate in your therapy. You don't have to lay down. You don't have to sit down. You could get up and pace around. You could walk. You could stand on your head. It doesn't matter. Whatever gets you engaged in therapy and actively involved in what's going on during that 50-minute therapeutic session is the only thing that actually matters. Uh, but for Freud, that was not the case. The idea that everybody had a mind with the subconscious, again, Freud's uh, theoretical idea, which has no scientific justification today. The idea that the subconscious contributes more relevance to psychology than conscious awareness. Uh, that comes from the idea that you have almost certainly heard that Freud's concept of your mind, uh, and the mind being the, uh, the most general way to, to describe these ideas, is that most of the, your thinking occurs subconsciously so that you're not aware of it and only a small portion of all the things that occurs in your mind is something that you're actually aware of and so Freud being from Northern Europe used a metaphor of an iceberg that an iceberg most of an iceberg is underwater and only a small amount of it above of course that, that metaphor doesn't work very good in South Florida uh, but Let's not worry about that little point. Defense mechanisms, as I mentioned. Defense mechanisms are a theoretical idea that Freud created that cover up the subconscious thinking and keep the subconscious thinking from ever becoming a, uh, or being made aware of by the person. So these defense mechanisms are processes that protect the person from the thoughts that are really undesirable. So this, this is somewhat of an odd idea today, uh, but from Freud's standpoint, you have thoughts in your head that are so disturbing that your brain cover those, covers them up. And if you ever became aware of them, it would cause you to develop a psychological disorder. So metaphorically, I like to play with the idea that these bad ideas in your head, and this is all Freud's thinking, these bad ideas in your head are like radiation. And placing the, radi uh, the radioactivity inside of a lead box is like having the, uh, the defense mechanism protect you from the damaging effects of the radiation. But if that lead box ever allows some of the radiation to leak out, that's, that's where the beginning of psychological symptoms begin in Freud's uh, theoretical approach. And again, let me repeat, there is no good scientific evidence for any of this stuff uh, operating. Uh, there was lots of studies back in the early 20th century which consistently found a lack of evidence so that the researchers simply had to move on. These ideas, though, 
are things that you probably shouldn't even be aware of other than the fact that in the media these ideas are regurgitated over and over again as the basis for psychology today. They show up in literature, plot lines in movies, uh, they are to a great degree much of the psycholog psychological development for characters in horror films today um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so Freud's model exists in a lot of different ways so that the psychological processes in Freud's model will become very easily understood by people in society today and uh, people will have a tendency to believe that these things are actually how they operate despite the fact that there again is no scientific evidence for them. One of the ones that still shows up uh, you'll see on TV as well, slips of the tongue. Uh, slips of the tongue are supposed to be times during which a person says something in which a subconscious thought slips through the defense mechanism and comes out consciously. So for example, I keep telling you that Sigmund Freud has not contributed anything useful to scientific psychology for the 21st century, and that's absolutely true. But if during this lecture, I say something like Sigmund Freud is a uh, is a theoretician from the early 20th century and you say ho oh, oh, hold on there you just called him Sigmund Freud not Sigmund Freud and I would say oh oh I didn't realize I did that that would sound like a slip of the tongue uh, and the slip of the tongue in this case would be the hatred I have for Sigmund Freud slipping through the fence and then showing up in uh, the way I speak. So I'm violating the common principles of politeness in society and uh, some of these ugly thoughts from my subconscious are leaking through and that's, uh, that's how they play themselves out. In reality, uh, a slip of the tongue are really most closely related to speech patterns. In fact, most of the work that actually satisfied uh, the understanding of slips of the tongue actually came from linguists. Linguists who study language and how people make speech errors, for example, way back in the early 20th century, I think largely by the 1940s, largely showed a great deal of evidence indicating that the manner in which slips of the tongue occur are based primarily on uh, the phonetic aspects of speech, the placement of the word in a sentence, the meaning of the word, but not specifically related to an underlying psychological disorder or other type of thought process. It's such a juicy tidbit for gossip that if somebody makes a slip of the tongue publicly that you can accuse them of uh, having bad thoughts um, is uh, the kind of process that plays itself out publicly. And in fact, one of the things you actually see with the, the purpose of this stuff playing out in the media is that it gives people, usually a large group of people, an opportunity to judge somebody very poorly uh, so that you have temporary social power over that individual. As a process, this is a process we're going to wind up seeing more of in the social psychology chapter um, and as we start to talk about you know, why, why is the internet so filled with people like trolls that just insult other people. Um, it's all part of the same process. It's a, it's a process of social power that you get over somebody else and it plays out in an entertaining value in the media which ultimately supports their bottom financial line which is the primary job of a media system is to generate an income it's entertaining for the people that use it but <clears throat> what it does is it gives a very biased view of what psychology actually is today because most psychologists don't apply these ideas and Freud's model uh, Freud works mostly with adults he does work with a handful of children, but he works mostly with adults. 
And that should make sense essentially from the medical framework that it, we're going from. In the 1890s, there is no medical insurance in Vienna, Austria. And in fact, if, you're, if you have a, a neurological problem and you go to see Freud, you have to pay out of pocket. And as you might imagine, that's going to be fairly expensive. The people that are going to go for neurological treatments are going to be primarily adults who can afford to go for medical treatment. If you're a child, if you can't afford treatment, you're simply not going to wind up on Freud's radar and he's never going to interact with you. So you're never going to contribute to his overall theoretical understanding of human nature. So there is a very clear selection bias of the people from Vienna, Austria in the 1890s and the early 20th century that actually contribute their understanding of human nature to Sigmund Freud that leads to Freud's development of theories. And it's almost all in, um, adults that are actually doing this uh, contributing. Those are the subjects that he works with. However, Freud, because he theorizes that an individual's psychological symptoms that exist today are largely a result of a traumatic emotional event that occurred earlier in their life, which has then been covered up by a defense mechanism that the person is not aware of because the defense mechanism has covered it up, thereby producing a repressed memory. And now as an adult, the repressed memory or defense mechanism is not functioning fully and parts of those damaging thoughts are starting to leak out. That's where the symptomology of the psychological disorder comes from in adulthood, right? And that idea, the idea that a, an adult has a psychological disorder as a result of an early traumatic event that they have repressed is a very common idea in society today. It is exactly coming from Freud's approach. And there is no consistent, strong evidence for any such thing at all at the current time. This is simply bad thinking. It has been sold to you over and over again through the media, but it is bad thinking. And this is why I'm covering it. If you have a tendency to believe the things that you've heard on television, and you very well may, if you've never had a psychology course before, you may think that this is how psychological processes uh, function in terms of disorders, but it is not the case. Uh, the memory systems that we've talked about, the information processing model of memory, does not allow for repressed memories. The defense mechanisms that we talk about with Freud today simply do not have good evidence that actually supports their existence. And so the idea that you could have a traumatic event that you forget about or cover up that causes problems in adulthood is simply a system that does not really exist. Now, oddly enough, in Freud's model, despite the fact that he's only working with adults, he comes up with a developmental theory of personality. And that seems really odd, right? How can you come up with a developmental theory of model if you're only working with adults? If you come up with a developmental theory of uh, personality, you would have had to have worked with young children and uh, toddlers and adolescents and teenagers and young adults and older individuals to see how psychological development occurs over time. But instead, Freud mostly works with adults and then comes up with a developmental model. Well, how this actually plays itself out is again, you'll, you'll see the, the Freud's poor logic in this case. However, again, not to give Freud uh, so much of a hard time, he is working during a period in which very little is known about psychological disorders. So he, his only ability to work with this uh, information is to theorize about it. And what he does is this, because Freud believes that 
any adult psychological disorder today is a result of a traumatic event that occurred earlier in her life. He has conjured up in his head, theoretically, what age range the psychological dis uh, event, the relevant trauma had actually occurred, whether it occurred when they were one years old or three years old or five years old or seven years old, for example. And that the traumatic event would cause different types of symptoms in adulthood. And so in a purely secondary fashion from working with adults and evaluating the symptoms that they had, he theorized about the time frame in which the psychological traumatic event would have occurred to them and then put an age time period on it and then labeled these general periods in time through development to create a developmental personality model. Freud's model has uh, five, uh, five stages, an oral, an anal, a phallic, a latency, and a genital stage. And uh, psychological disorders occur because by Freud's model, again, purely theoretical, if you pass through any of these stages comfortably, you simply move on to the other stage. However, if a problem arises during that stage, then you will develop a fixation. And fixation is a term certainly you would be familiar with today. And this is exactly where the idea is coming from. When you say somebody has a fixation, it refers to the fact that they, have, that they are stuck at a particular psychological level of development. And so if you're passing through the oral stage, for example, the oral stage of development, and problems occur in the oral stage, your psychic energies become stuck at that point. Now, what the heck are psychic energies? Well, that's again, another theoretical idea. It was just Freud's attempt to understand that through the process of development, something passes through it. What is it? Well, he doesn't know. So he refers to it as psych uh, psychic energy. It's a very abstracted, theoretical idea okay and of course as I'm going to tell you again there is no concrete evidence that anything like a psychic energy actually exists today so it is something you should just never apply in your thinking at the current time but for Freud's model if a person um, does not pass through the uh, oral stage of development properly their psychic energy will become stuck there. That, will, that problem will be covered up by a defense mechanism. Years and possibly decades will go by, and then possibly for any one person, the defense mechanism will no longer sufficiently hold back the problematic subconscious thoughts. They will leak out into the person's conscious behavior, and those will become the symptoms for the psychological disorder the individual has. And so these, uh, these five stages are all based around um, aspects of sex in some, in some uh, manner. The oral stage was based around the idea that, uh, from Freud's theoretical idea, and again, all these, uh, all these concepts are uh, not supported by any kind of evidence today, uh, that for a child, uh, feeding is the most important thing for them. So if they are breastfed enough uh, properly, they will pass through the oral stage. The anal stage is related to toilet training. If a child is toilet trained properly, then uh, their personality will develop normally. If there's problems in toilet training, then they might become quote unquote anal. So for example, even when people refer to themselves as anal today, or what you hear that as a slang term, that comes directly from Freud's model. Um, a, a person that you refer to as anal is somebody that tries to control things. They organize their day, they set a plan, they <clears throat> make a, a list of tasks that they're going to do, they have to do things in a particular way. That person is referred to as anal. And that name, anal, is starting to be 
turned over to uh, referring to them as OCD now, obsessive compulsive disorder. You compulsively have to do things a certain way. Referring to somebody anal was a little bit more common a couple of decades ago. People starting to use the term OCD, uh, but it's the same idea. Uh, the remaining stages you don't really hear about, the, f uh, the phallic, latency, and genital stages, but they mostly are related to um, child's uh, capacity to control their sexual urges. Now, one of the most bizarre um, components of uh, Freud's model comes from the Oedipal Complex. And the Oedipal Complex was a very long-winded, overly complicated way to try to understand modeling. So for example, today, the idea that if you see somebody do something and you can copy the behavior, that's called modeling. It's a very simple, straightforward process. And there's even literally networks of cells in your brain that have been identified that allow you to be able to watch somebody do something and then copy that pattern of behavior. And so it fits a, a very standard scientific process today. In Freud's approach, the argument that took place in the early 20th century was this. From the standpoint of a Freudian psychologist, they would make this argument. A household will have a father and a mother, and they might have two children, a boy and a daughter. Now, why is it most likely that the boy will grow up and act like the father, and the girl will grow up and act like the mother? The argument from the Freudians was, if what the behavioral psychologist would say is that things tend to be more random, that half the boys should grow up and act like the father and half the boys should grow up and act like their mother and half the girls should grow up and act like their mother and half the girls should grow up and act like their father. That was the Freudian's explanation of how the behaviorist would deal with things. The way in which the Freudians tried to fix this idea was that every young boy has a sexual attraction to their opposite sex parent and tries to engage that individual in sex. However, the same sex parent always blocks this activity from occurring. And because <clears throat> as a young boy, if you try to have sex with your mother and your father always blocks it, you always act more and more like your father because your father's the only one that can have sex with your mother. And that's why from a Freudian standpoint, Little boys grow up and always act like their father. It's from years of attempt at trying to bed their own mother. There's another process called the electrocomplex, which is the exact same process, but now from the standpoint of a daughter. Every daughter grows up, has a sexual attraction toward her father, but her mother blocks it. And because her mother is the only one that can have sex with her father, the daughter just acts like the mother more and more over time in hopes of eventually betting her own father. But by the time 20 years goes by, she simply acts like her mother. And that's where the idea comes from. Now, this idea will sound completely bizarre today, but it was a very popular idea in the early 20th century. And keep in mind as well that this bizarre idea came from an individual that created a developmental model of personality who never really worked with children that based all of the developmental processes on sexual activity and then came up with a process of modeling that was very long-winded and overly complicated that engaged a story about um, incest as a way to explain modeling. Uh, Freud's model is just absolutely bizarre by uh, current standards today. And uh, you really should never engage in any of these things, even though you still hear about edible complexes or even in the more uh, recently repackaged version of Freud, where you don't actually use the term edible complex. But here's one where you see on talk shows, uh, a popular idea play itself out that comes directly from Freud, but plays itself out on talk shows now. The idea that men grow up and want to marry women that are similar to their mother.
The idea is that the way people describe it now is that a guy will want to marry a woman who will do his laundry and cook his food and take care of him like he's a baby. That's a, that is directly pulled out of Freud's edible complex. Um, the fact that you are marrying somebody like your mother is just Freud's edible complex in which you engage in this incestual relationship with your own mother. Of course, this whole idea is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there is no edible complex that actually uh, that you can actually justifiably say exists. And the idea that uh, boys want to grow up and marry somebody like their mother is also an equally bad idea. It's again another attempt by the media to use a rather dramatic and somewhat offensive approach to describe a psychological process where a bunch of people can stand around and point their finger at somebody and refer to how disgusting they are. Um, and why that actually is a process that will play itself out on TV is for the same reasons why there are so many trolls on the internet, which is a topic we kind of have to get to the social psychology chapter to talk about. Uh, but to, just to say it in a simple way now, it gives you an opportunity to have some social power over another individual so that you can accuse them of bad behavior and the rest of the other people doing the accusations make yourselves feel better. Now, Freud had a lot of defense mechanisms in his model. Um, we're not going to cover all of them. There are more of them in the textbook, which you should look at because you will uh, you will be able to find them in society uh, on talk shows. If you watch talk shows, uh, you will have people. Uh, you will come across people that will assume that they actually exist because they've heard about them. These three, repression, regression, and projection, um, are ones that we're going to talk about uh, briefly at the current time, and then we'll be finished with the uh, topic of Freud. We've actually discussed uh, two of these already. Um, repression, specifically as a defense mechanism, refers to a repressed memory. And we've actually dealt with repressed memories in uh, detail back in the memory chapter. The information processing model of memory, which is a, a reasonably good scientific model of memory that we use at the current time, does not allow for any sort of process of repression. Uh, it's simply not there. Uh, and that is a well-defined uh, model created through empirical research starting back around the 1950s and for 70 years now has been one of the primary models in which we understand memory. The idea that you can experience a traumatic event and then cover it up with a process called repression so that you're not aware of the memory any longer is simply a process that doesn't occur. When we talked about this idea in the memory chapter, it all revolved around the idea today when people try to remember something and can't and then later on do remember it. But they don't see it as a failure to retrieve initially with better retrieval cues in the future at which point they can retrieve the memory. Instead what happens is you generally refer to a memory you couldn't remember and then later on do as a, a repressed memory simply because that's the way people talk about them. But the repressed memory is actually a Freudian concept that engages a specific defense mechanism. If you can't remember something today but you remember it tomorrow that's simply an issue of retrieval. It does not engage a repression defense mechanism of which nobody can actually justifiably say exists. Regression. Regression is a process we talked about in the States of Consciousness chapter because it was related to uh, the idea that hypnosis would allow you to age regress a person back to an earlier time in their life so they could relive a traumatic event. And uh, that simply is not a process that occurs. Once scientific studies of hypnosis started to take place in the 1970s, you found that there was no evidence 
of a capacity to age regress somebody. And in fact, the greater version of age regression, if you age regress somebody back to age five or four or three or two or one, or keep on going, you then engage the story of life regression, right? Hypnotize somebody and bring them back to before they were born, which would mean a previous life. That's where you get the idea of age regression uh, in hypnosis. And if you cannot age regress somebody back to age five, I seriously doubt you can regress them back into an earlier life. And the final defense mechanism uh, that we're going to focus on is projection. Projection is actually a process that uh, you might not be as aware of how much it is in your own language. Saying that somebody else projects their feelings on you or that you know, you're know you projecting your feelings onto somebody else is probably a, a phrase that you've heard of. Uh, but the defense mechanism projection, which is essentially what you're actually doing. Uh, you are taking hidden feelings from your subconscious, which are leaking out through a defense mechanism and being displayed in your conscious behavior. But you're not consciously aware that you're doing it. So when you're projecting your feelings onto somebody else, you're not aware that you're doing it and it's usually other people that identify the fact that you're doing it. And again, remember, this idea is a bad idea. It all comes from theorizing by Freud. There are things that look like projection today, which keep causing people to use the phrase projection, despite the fact that projection is actually not a real topic uh, in scientific psychology today. Um, the concept of projection also has given you a phrase, and that is to kick the cat. To kick the cat means uh, you come home from work and your cat you know, meows and wants to be fed and you just wind up kicking it. What you're doing is you're taking out all your frustrations on your cat. Um, and in a more specific Freudian sense, in a way that you've probably never heard the details, the idea that if you have a job that you uh, really hate, so you really hate your boss and you want to murder your boss because you hate your boss so bad, from Freud's standpoint, you would suppress the feelings of murder against your boss and they would be covered up by a defense mechanism. Now, in some cases, these feelings of murderous rage would leak out and all become focused on some topic in your environment, something, a person or a physical object that you would destroy and you would be playing out the destruction of the thing you actually hated by smashing something. So from a Freudian standpoint, if somebody had a temper tantrum and busted up a bunch of things in their bedroom, Freud would say that the person's anger about something else was leading them to symbolically smash the objects in the room, and that's what was actually happening. In the case of your cat, who just wants to be fed a can of Alpo, you project all your rage onto the cat, and then you kick it to kick the cat. That's exactly where the phrase comes from, and it comes from this 100% overly complicated theoretical approach presented by Sigmund Freud as a way to understand um, a pattern of behavior that today would be understood in a very simple way. You come home from work, you're irritable because you really hate your job, and then when somebody puts a responsibility at your feet, like you have to feed the cat, you got to take out the trash, you have to talk to your children, what do you do? You start yelling. You yell and you slam things and you get angry and everybody stays away from you because every day when you come home from work, you're just angry. Well, 
in that case, today, people would just say, take some time out and calm down. Drive around the block a few times. Listen to some good music. Do something to put yourself in a better mood. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to come back to you learning how to control your own emotional state because if you hate your job and you come home and you treat everybody in your house poorly, you're just making your, worse, your life worse. So if you come home angry, you're just making your life worse by treating everybody in your family poorly. And uh, Freud would describe this through the projection process, but a modern psychological approach would simply refer to it as a manner of self-control for your own anger and finding out where your anger should be directed uh, for maybe finding a new job or finding a polite way to address problems in the workplace, uh, but not becoming angry at work, which probably is not going to be a very helpful uh, way to solve your problem.